Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. Thank you. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at The Hammer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Conversation with Professor Randall Kennedy and the Reverend James Lawson. We are truly honored to have both of them here tonight. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't especially thank my good friend James Fugate from ESA One Bookstore in Lamert Park for helping me put tonight's program together. James is a national treasure. Please frequent ESA One Books and you will enjoy it. Um, this year, 2014, is the 50th anniversary of many critical events in American history and internationally. 50 years ago, in 1964, Nelson Mandela was just being sentenced to life in prison in South Africa. The Vietnam War began with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The Congress of Racial Equality was leading a boycott of the public schools in New York City as a response to racial segregation. Malcolm X was making his Hajj to Mecca, and three young American civil rights workers were murdered by members of the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan. Um, most significantly for tonight's discussion, we're also marking the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, initiated by JFK Jr. and signed by President Lyndon Johnson, which outlawed racial discrimination in voter registration, job discrimination, and segregation of public facilities, including hotels, theaters, and restaurants. And in October of 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolence. It's pretty amazing and also pretty disconcerting to think that all of these things just happened 50 years ago, which for me seems very, very recent. Um, but I think that as many of us will agree, racism is still alive and well in the United States. The murder of Trayvon Martin, the disemboweling of affirmative action in the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court in the past year, the shameful inequality in the nation's judiciary and prison system, as well as in the funding of public schools, the racial epithets hurled openly at the president, most openly by a sheriff in New Hampshire. These are open, obvious, and clear manifestations of the covert racism that's bubbled beneath the surface of America since the era of slavery and the end of the Civil War. To me, racism appears to be getting more overt and more virulent in the past few years, but one of our eminent speakers tonight disagrees. He sees the glass as half full, and he thinks that Americans are responding to these incidents with horror rather than complacency, and that that's a good sign, and I really hope he's right. So tonight we have two people here today who are working at the forefront of race relations in the United States. They're going to have a very frank and informal discussion with each other about what was going on in the 1960s and what's going on now in the United States. Randall Kennedy is a professor at Harvard Law School where he teaches contracts on con courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. He was born in Columbia, South Carolina, and educated at Princeton University, Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and Yale Law School. He served as a law clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals and for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. He's a member of the Bar in the District of Columbia and the Supreme Court of the United States. Professor Kennedy writes for a wide range of scholarly and general interest publications and was awarded the 1998 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for Race, Crime, and the Law. His most recent books are For Discrimination, Race, Affirmative Action, and the Law, The Persistence of the Color Line, Racial Politics, and the Obama Presidency, Sell Out, The Politics of Racial Betrayal, Interracial Intimacies, Sex, Marriage, Identity, and Adoption, and the last book I can't say the name of, but it's N-Word, The Strange Career of a Troublesome Word. Kennedy's also a member of the American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Association, and a charter trustee of Princeton University. And he is currently working on a book on the history of the civil rights movement from a legal perspective. Reverend James Lawson, Jr. is an American activist and university professor, and I would add hero to that. He was a leading theoretician and tactician of nonviolence within the civil rights movement. During the 1960s, he served as a mentor to the Nashville Student Movement and the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. And he continues to train activists in nonviolence to this day right here in Los Angeles. While a freshman at Baldwin Wallace College in Ohio, he joined the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE, an organization affiliated with the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation. Both CORE and the fellowship advocated nonviolent resistance to, to racism. 
Consistent with, the, with those principles of nonviolence, he declared himself a conscientious objector and refused to report for the draft in 1951. And he served 14 months in prison after refusing to accept either student or ministerial deferment. After his relief, release from prison, he went uh, as a Methodist missionary to India where he studied the principles of nonviolent resistance that Muhammad, Mohandas Gandhi and his followers had developed. He then returned to the United States in 1955, where he was introduced to Martin Luther King Jr., who had led the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama and had also embra embraced Gandhi's principles of nonviolent resistance. King urged Lawson to move to the South, which he did. He then moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and enrolled as a graduate student at the Divinity School of Vanderbilt University, where he served as the Southern Director for Corps and began conducting nonviolent training workshops for the SLC, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. While in Nashville, he met and mentored a number of young students at Vanderbilt, Fisk University, and other area schools in the tactics of nonviolent direct action. And in 1959 and 1960, Lawson and the activists he trained launched the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins to challenge segregation in downtown stores. Along with activists from elsewhere in the South, they formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in, in April 1960. His students played a leading role in the open theater movement, the Freedom Rides, the 1963 March on Washington, Mississippi Freedom Summer, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the 1963 Birmingham Children's Crusade, the 1965 Selma Voting Rights Movement, the 1966 Chicago Open Housing Movement, and the Anti-Vietnam War Movement over the next several years. His expulsion from Vanderbilt University as a result of the activities of these activities became one of the celebrated incidents of the era and gradually a source of deep embarrassment to the university. And during the 2006 graduation ceremony, Vanderbilt University apologized for its treatment to Lawson and he's now a member of its faculty. He became a pastor of Centenary Methodist Church in Memphis, Tennessee in 1962. And in 1968, when black sanitation workers went on strike for higher wages and union recognition after two of their co-workers were accidentally crushed to death, Reverend Lawson served as chairman of their strike committee. He invited Dr. King to Memphis in April 1968 to dramatize their struggle, which had adopted the slogan, I am a man. Dr. King delivered his famous mountaintop speech in support of the strike in Memphis on April 3, 1968, the day before his assassination. Later, Lawson moved to Los Angeles in 1974 to lead Holman United Methodist Church in the West Adams District, where he served for 25 years before retiring in 1999. He's continued to train activists in, non activists in nonviolence and to work in support of a number of causes, including immigrants' rights in the United States, the rights of Palestinians, opposition to the war in Iraq, and workers' rights to a living wage, as well as women's and LGBT rights issues. In 2004, he received the Community of Christ International Peace Award. Lately, he's been spearheading a new initiative in civil discourse and social change at Cal State Northridge as a visiting faculty member. He also teaches here at UCLA in the UCLA Labor Center and at Vanderbilt University. And he also teaches, continues to teach his ongoing workshops in nonviolent social justice organizing at Holman United Methodist Church. And I am hoping to persuade him to teach a class here at the Hammer next fall that would be open to the public. So maybe you can help me persuade him. So following their conversation here tonight, Reverend Lawson and Professor Kennedy are gonna take audience questions, and then there, we're gonna have an informal reception with tea and cookies out in the courtyard. Um, we will have copies of Randall Kennedy's latest book for affirmative action for sale, and I'm sure he'd be very happy to sign um, copies of the book as well, but I hope you'll stay and we can all visit for a little bit afterwards. And now, without further ado, please join me in a very warm welcome for Reverend James Lawson and Professor Randall Kennedy. Well, thank you very much for the generous introduction. We um, plan to proceed as follows. We're just going to have a discussion here for a while. And uh, after we talk for a while, we're going to turn the um, dialogue into a um, uh, discussion that's open to everyone, and let's just have a good time. I, um, I'm going to start off things with a, a question for uh, Reverend Lawson, but before I do, I'd just like to say that um, I just, the Civil Rights Movement was one of the great 
periods in American history. It was one of the great um, examples of um, insurgency, not only in American history, but actually in world history. And there were many great people associated with that movement. And I must say, I just feel personally um, delighted and honored to share the stage with one of the great heroes of that period. It's my mutual feeling too, uh, Randall Kennedy, oh. Professor Kennedy. I'm delighted to be here and to have the privilege of getting to know you a little better and to uh, have this conversation. I look forward to it. Okay, well, let's good. start up. Okay, good. First, <clears throat> um, so I know that, I mean, you've been, one, one of the remarkable things about you is that you've been involved in social justice work for, well, for well over half a century. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement is one of the movements in which you've participated, but I'd, I'd like to begin with that one. And my, my first question is, could you please share with us a couple of moments, one, two, three moments that were particularly memorable for you? And I'm, I'm looking for moments that were, that uh, struck you personally. They could be especially poignant moments, or especially scary moments, or especially instructive moments. What are some moments in that period that, that have really stuck with you over the, the decades? Well, I've, <clears throat> I've not really tried to give attention to that kind of a question. But um, I think one of, the, uh, one of those moments would be when uh, it was a sanitation strike, and in particular, April the 4th, 1968, the assassination of Martin King. I was chairman of that strike for the community, one of the organizers and all the rest of it. So that would be one moment. Uh, second moment would be an episode of abject fear, three, four years later in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I don't think any campaign was going on, but um, there was a moment in the street where I became so fearful and frightened that I had to pull over to the curb and stop the car and sit still for a while. What happened? Uh, I calmed down. <laughs> but what, I mean, what, provoked the, the what provoked the fear? Well, a variety of things. I don't think there was any one trigger. I think a series of triggers, maybe. I'm not sure what was the most important trigger uh, at that time. It was a period of calm, though in Memphis we almost always had something going on. So, And I can't remember exactly what was going on, but I do remember the moment of fear. One can call that existential <laughs> fear. So that might be a second one. Um, I think a third one might be on the Mississippi March, 1963, 1966, against fear, when um, a group of us, including Martin King and Stokely Carmichael and Bob Green, and I'm not sure how many others, but not maybe 10 or 15 of us, uh, picked up the march from Hernando, Mississippi, where just outside of Memphis, where Meredith had been shot. And the next day, we were there at that spot and continued the walk southward through Mississippi. And at one point on that second day, uh, the state troopers and the police confronted us in a moment um, where there could have been shooting on the spot, killing on the spot, and somehow we managed to get through it. Okay. Um, 
same, same period, same period, you're leading people, you're constantly having to make decisions. You can go this way, you can go this way. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what you think were some of the good decisions made during that period. And follow up, I'm going to ask, is what you think were some of the bad ones. <laughs> So, for instance, I mean, the, the march against fear. Not everybody wanted to have a march against fear. That's that true. Very, that was a very controversial thing. Yes, it was. Okay, so go ahead. Well, I agree with you that the, that the civil rights movement, uh, which still has not been understood on the American scene, was the second most momentous series of years in, in the whole development of the United States. I, I actually call it the Second American Revolution because the questions in 1789 and 1776 that could not be resolved or talked about or faced were questions that were faced, namely the, the humanity of black people um, the question of Jim Crow law, slavery, consequences. So it was the largest, broadest, most comprehensive discussion that the nation has had about itself. That, and we, we, of course, need it again in, the, in this 21st century. I think one of the very best decisions that was made in the movement um, was the recognition by Martin King and people like uh, Kelly Miller Smith and others that what had happened in Montgomery in terms of the development of a nonviolent bus boycott was exceptional, a phen phenomenon that could be repeated and should be repeated. Um, and therefore, in Nashville, a group of us made the decision we were going to repeat it. And we organized, we began organizing in 1959 in January. Uh, that was one of the best decisions made because the decision on the part of a relatively small group, maybe 30 to 40 people uh, in Nashville, that the next best strategy for the movement was to desegregate public life, get the signs pulled down, get the changes made, um, was perhaps the most um, significant decision of strategizing next to the decision of the NAACP to go after cleaning up the Constitution and get segregation declared unconstitutional. So I think that was one of the best decisions. You know, it's interesting that you talk about the, um, the sit-in movement, because the sit-in movement, the attack on private racial discrimination, led ultimately to Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And one thing that I, I found interesting is that in, 19, in, the, in the early 60s, in the run-up to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which, you know, this summer is the 50th, anniversary of it. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, Title II, the fight over public accommodations, was the most contentious part of the act. That's, yes. that's the part of the act where people were mm -hmm. willing to fight and die. But one of the interesting things is, nowadays, that's viewed as completely uncontroversial. Yes. And in fact, fairly, fairly quickly after 1964, yeah. the signs came down and it became very uncontroversial, so that now people don't even think about it much. That now, I mean, there are other parts of it, you know, Title VII, for instance, the employment discrimination part, it's litigated day in and day out That's all right. across America, Continue. but not Title II. That's a very good point, yeah. And not only is that the case in relationship to the South, but it's also the case in relationship to other kinds of signs that were available in 60, in 50 and 40, mm. 
the, the no dirty Irish signs, the no WAP signs, the no wetback signs, the no chink signs, no the no signs. WAP signs. That, that were really all around the United States. I think this is a very important thing because in spite of our being a dis democratic society or trying to be a democratic society, those signs were across the country. And then custom across the country that would say, if you're an Indian in Dakota, you can't come in into the, you can't come into the skating rink. <laughs> um, and of course, black people in Los An in, in Los Angeles could not eat anywhere downtown, nor had Hispanic people for the most part. So all those signs and the custom that p helped to enforce those signs all disappeared rather rapidly. So you'd be hard pressed to find a sign saying no Indian or no colored person um, today mm -hmm. in the United States. Whereas we lived under them for 50 years without any protests. I think that's a, a very good one. And Title II did. After an accumulation of assaults on that, the Freedom Ride, mm -hmm. the Birmingham Campaign, the Freedom Schools, the Mississippi Summer, that title did get passed and actually changed the face of the nation. And it's hardly understood. Um, or hardly seen. But what would you say is one of the s most significant decisions of that period? Well, one of the th great things about that period is that, I mean, in a, between 1950 and, let's say, 1970, there were, there were three, in, in terms of the law, and that's how I tend to look at things. Uh, in terms of the law, there were a couple of great developments. Great development number one was the invalidation of de jure segregation. Mm -hmm. I mean, people forget that you know, prior to 1954, segregation was not viewed as discrimination. Right. It was viewed, you know, there was no problem with separate but equal because if the, you know, if the colored people go over here and the white people go over here, everybody's being treated equally. Who, who can complain? White people cannot go to school with black people. White person can't complain. Black person can't go to school with white people. Everybody's tr being treated the same. So before 1954, before Brown versus Board mm -hmm. of Education, segregation was viewed as being completely compatible with the idea of the equal protection of the law. Um, second, and so Thurgood Marshall, Mr. Civil Rights, and the others did a good job of invalidating yeah. that idea. Although it took a while. I mean, remember, that was 1954. Brown versus Board of Education was 1954. Um, you still had laws that prohibited people from marrying across the race line until 1967. So that was one. Second, the attack on private racial discrimination, and the great accomplishment there was the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The attack on racial disfranchisement, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then in 1968, after Martin Luther King's death, uh, the, uh, the attack on housing discrimination. Those were the big legal accomplishments of the era. But I, I want to ask you a, 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 my follow-up about, because I mean, you, were, you saw these people. You were around Stokely Carmichael. You were around Martin Luther King Jr. You, you, know, you were around James Bevel. You were around all these people. What about, because you know, nowadays we look back, we sometimes romanticize things. Let's be real. Were there decisions made that you think were bad decisions? And I, I especially ask you this because I know that you have been throughout your life a staunch pacifist. So as a staunch pacifist, how did you view, for instance, you know, you were, you know, the, what, what did you think of Stokely Carmichael's call for black power in 1965? How did you view the Black Panther Party? <laughs> well, I, I want to go back maybe before that, because I happen to think that, that 
a poor decision that was made in the midst of the movement was the decision on the part of traditional black leadership, including national leadership of the NAACP, um, that determined that direct action, mass action, was not the way to go for social change. Mm -hmm. And that decision was made, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the reasons why today black people are not engaged in continuous protest of racism in the 21st century, which is still very present, extremely powerful, extremely influential in the domestic and foreign policies of the United States and practices. So I think that was a bad decision. So that I, as I look around the country, I don't see a wholesale black resistance, maybe among gang members and some others who are very angry and upset and who've digested too much of the racism themselves, who are therefore quite angry and say so, but basically you don't, do not see the black community in wholesale challenge of the Tea Party, of the public racism, of the public denigration of women in public life, and a whole range of other issues that are now seen as normal in the American scene, but really point to a wrong direction for the United States in my judgment, period. I, I don't understand, when you say that the black leadership didn't get behind mass mobilization, what do you mean? I mean, what about the Selma campaign? What about the Birmingham campaign? What about efforts well, in Chicago? I mean, what, weren't those mass mobilizations? Well, you're talking about very specific campaigns that sought to be nonviolent campaigns. And generally speaking, traditional black leadership may have supported it in some ways in different places, mm -hmm. but for the most part, the call was that we can best do this through the law, mm -hmm. and we can best do this through, um, um, quietly through, through gradual strategies in the background. Uh, I can give specific illustrations. Um, do. Freedom, the, the uh, the 1960 sit-in campaign, when various students around the South called the NAACP, the Urban League, and other organizations saying, should we do this, where they had local chap campus chapters. They were told emphatically, that's not the way to do it, so we don't want you to support it. That happened in Nashville for any number, you know, uh, in that instance. The Freedom Ride was basically frowned upon. It was done by Congress of Racial Equality and Jim Farmer, who was president of it. it. It was interesting, but it was not seen as something that could really make a difference. And then, when the FBI conspired with the local police and with the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council in Alabama to thwart it, so you got the burning bus and the white mobs in, Mon in, in Birmingham, um, and, and the 13 riders in the original group were called, called were too wounded, too weary to continue, and flew to New Orleans, which is a story in itself. We in Nashville, because of our grounding in nonviolent struggle and demonstrations, we said we cannot let that violence stop this legitimate, peaceful demonstration of the freedom ride. So we organized among ourselves, and we said, we'll pick it up. Yep. The Nashville campaign picked it up. And so we sent volunteers to Birmingham, and then volunteers to Montgomery, and then volunteers to take the buses into Jackson, Mississippi, and the trains in the Mississippi. So that did not have the general support of traditional leadership. Yeah. Well, so, I mean. So I, that's I, what I mean. Yeah, I understand. I, I work for. I worked for Mr. Civil Rights, Thurgood Marshall, and I talked to him about it, and he was definitely against yes, I know. the sit-ins. Yeah. 
I mean, he, you know, yeah. I mean, he, he later changed. He did. Yeah. To he his to his credit, yes. but he was definitely against oh, the yes. law. He thought he thought you could do through the law. Yeah. Well, now here's the problem from my point of view that we face that we have to face today. That it's one thing to have a very good law and a very good constitution. It's another thing to get that law, get that constitution and the spirit of that law and constitution into the minds of local communities and people, into the mind of the average citizen. That requires community organizing and mobilizing. That, that involves conversation and action. That involves confrontation even, which is what nonviolent direct action represents. So you can't get that law obeyed without somehow you draw the people for a variety of motivations into the actualization of the law, which is why, in spite of May 17, 1954, mm -hmm. desegregation is at a major height. I mean, not desegregation, school segregation is, a, is at a major place of stability in the American school, public school scene in, in many, many parts of the country, even though it's even though we know it's unequal education. Let's let's move things closer to the present moment. And again, uh -huh. I'd, I'd like to sort of preface this by by saying that again, one of the things that's really striking about your career is that you've uh, continued the good fight over a good long span. I mean, it's one thing to talk with people who were involved in social struggles a half century ago. But the fact of the matter is you've been involved in social struggles over all that time. So let's move closer to the present. How do you assess the various struggles for social justice today? Well, I, th I think there are some very good ones especially the DREAM Act students, um, the um, DREAM Act campaigns that have gone on for the last 10 years in various places of the country. I think that's one of the best. But on the other side of the coin, the DREAM Act people, interestingly enough, do not have the support of the traditional immigration human rights organizations in the United States. And there's been a fierce struggle going on for seven, eight, nine, ten years between the students who see the necessity of action to make these things change and their parent bodies, in some I use that term loosely, uh, who are engaged in human rights for immigrant people but who think that the DREAM Act people are not approaching it in the way they think it ought to be approached. So that, that's one example. Uh, I, I do not think that in the black community there is a comparable movement going on. There's anger, yes, and the Martin murder case arouses a certain period of time, but the systematic, protracted preparation of people strategizing of issues and going after, going after targeted strategic goals that is not going on generally in the United States. It's not going on in the union movement, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. It's not going on in the Hispanic community or the black community. Now that's a bad assessment. I mean, I'm making a bold statement. I'll be be glad to have people challenge me on it, but I think that's the case. And I want to add, there's no way for the United States to travel through the 21st century on its present course without massive disasters. It has to change course. There's no doubt about it. And we the people have to be the ones I think who must create nonviolent struggles and conflicts in such a way that in a, in a clear fashion tells the nation and the power structures of this nation 
we must change. This is wrong. We cannot continue this course. How do you respond to a person who says the following? Um, I hear you, but the fact of the matter is, in the United States of America, the president of the United States is an African American. The attorney general of the United States is an African American. In the previous administration, the administration of George W. Bush, the two secretaries of state were African Americans. Um, this is an extraordinary thing. 50 years ago, people, black people were fighting for just basic civil rights. Only a half century later, leading figures at the highest circles of governmental power are African Americans. Doesn't that suggest that the United States of America is a um, democracy that is attentive to the needs for social justice? Doesn't that, in fact, show a quite enlightened democracy? What would you say to that? Well, I, I would say that that sort of imagery is probably very, very helpful in the short run and maybe in the long run. But I would say, especially at the point of the National Security Advisor, National Security Council Advisor, at the level of the Secretary of State, They did not bring to the table, and apparently may not have had the power to bring to the table, small changes in our foreign policies, in our domestic, in our national stance around the world that could lead the country back towards democratic practice. They did not bring to the table anything that made a difference in American foreign policy. They did not bring anything to the table that caused the American people and the American governments to say that violence is not the way. Violence all across the world has continued to increase. Um, so no change. I mean, uh, people did not like Jimmy Carter as president. But Jimmy Carter, in that place, added to the American vision for the world and domestic and international policy, the notion that human rights mm -hmm. for all people was important. Now, we play games with that still, but at least he had the temerity to bring, you know, one, one element that could help in the long run to change the nation, that the human rights of people must be primary in American foreign policy. It hasn't happened yet. I don't know when it will happen. Imagery is important. And for my black community to have a black president is a, phenom a phenomenal thing in the black community. And we admire the fact that Barack Obama is the president. But I would say that even in the black community, he could carry on uh, an A to B <laughs> stance in a number of domestic and international affairs that might turn the clock. Now, I'll say immediately that I appreciate the fact that he has, in the last six years, tried to say America should not be the policeman sending troops into every country in the world. He has at least said that, though he has <laughs> also sent some troops into a place like the Congo. <laughs> But he's, he's, he, and especially in the recent weeks, he has tried to say, you know, what, a, what do my critics want in the Ukraine? They want us to send in an army? Well, that's, you know, that element in American life that sees only force, violent force, as the remedy for, for problems are a part of the cause of the plight of the human race and the plight of my own country today in the world. 
I'm going to ask one more question, and then let's open it up. Um, I'm going to ask this question, and then there will be people out there. If you ask a question, please take a uh, microphone, because this is being taped, and we, we, we want to hear your question, and we want a question, you know, not a speech, a question. <laughs> but here's, here, it, but so, so get ready for that. One last question I'm going to put to you, though, and here's, this is a, the night before Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, he gave a speech in which he said that he had glimpsed the promised land. And he said, remarkably, he said, I might not get there with you, but you will get there, and I have seen the promised land. My question to you is, what do you think the promised land looks like? What's the topography of the top promised land? What are its boundaries? I mean, are we, are we close to it? Are we far apart from it? What would, what would racial justice, what would the promised land look like? I, if, in my view, I don't think enough attention has been paid to that. To the future. To the future. And yeah, you know, what, what does it look like? Do, what do yeah. we want? If we had the power, what would we create? And you're going to try to answer that question yourself also? I think it's a yeah. tough question. I think it's a tough question. But, but I I'm want putting you it to you first. OK, and I'm putting it to you second. All right. All right. And it's I'll, a deal. And I'll start. OK. Well, uh, I think his, I think the metaphor he used um, needs to be recovered for Christianity in the United States. Uh, it is a metaphor that comes out of slavery. But it's a metaphor that comes out of the book of Exodus of the Old Testament. It is considered by the historians of Judaism to be the central event of the Old Testament, creating the central motion for life that is supposed to become universal, that we are in a journey from the Egypts and Pharaohs that hurt and main life towards developing the villages and the communities and the nations where life holds up the promise of access and possibilities of truth and justice and wonder. Uh, the black folk uh, held on to that promise and King was lifting up what was a part of his youth and my youth in the church. It is a better analysis of what the gospel of Jesus is about than <laughs> are you saved stuff that goes on in the United States and the junk that is coming out of public Christianity today. So I want to point, I want to lift that up as, as the first step. Life, according to that metaphor, is always a movement of healing and openness, mystery and wonder from the painful brokenness of life towards the development of wholeness and truth and power. We have to leave behind the old Egypts and pharaohs which are everywhere in the world and find the way to dismantle those and to create the new uh, possibilities. So what does it look like? I would say to you that one of the things it would look like is this. Public and university education that is quality for every child and every young person who wants it, whether in the vocational field or through the university, that begins to push back the Ill illiteracy of our country and the reliance on mythology in this country and allow uh, 315 million people to develop a huge base of wisdom and truth and understanding that will allow self-governance to become more of a great possibility. So I think that one goal of that desegregated society would be the goal of the nation that every baby born, no matter where 
or under what circumstances, every baby born will have access to life and access to learning and to education and all the things that can help that journey in life. You know, on... on no, you're gonna answer. I'm gonna answer, yeah, okay, I'm gonna yeah. answer, I'm, I, I promise. Uh, I'm, gonna, okay. or I'm gonna try yeah. to answer. I yeah. think it's a, it's a tough question. Um, and I come down to a place, I think, similar to your ending. You know, on, on June 13th, 1963, John F. Kennedy gave a speech, nationally televised speech, in which he talked about why it was that he was deputizing federal forces to enforce court orders in the, in the South. And I think at that point it was in, in Alabama. And in the course of making this speech, and by the way, I think it was that evening while he was making the speech that the great Medgar Evers was killed. But John F. Kennedy said during this speech, he asked, and he was clearly talking to white America. He said, you know, basically to white Americans, he said, you know, which of you would be willing to trade places with your black countrymen and countrywomen? So he was basically saying, you know, what, so, you know, put the racial shoe on the other foot. And so if somebody asked me, well, you know, What's the racial promised land? I'd be tempted to say, I tell you what, the racial promised land, we will know when we've hit the racial promised land when you can go to a hospital. And let's go to the, the, whatever hospital around here, the, the closest hospital to where, where we are now. You go to that hospital, you go to where the babies are born. You get a baby that's an hour old, two hours old, a day old. You have all those babies there, different, you know, different races. The racial promised land is when you cannot make predictions and, and quite reliable predictions about risk by taking a look at the color of the baby. So as it stands now, you can go to whatever hospital you want and you can, you know, you can say, well, you can make very reliable predictions about mm -hmm. um, who's gonna live longer you can make predictions about who's going to be able to have, you know, have, you know, higher education. Mm -hmm. You can make very good predictions about who's going to, you know, who's at risk for incarceration. You can make risk, you can make all sorts of uh, very reliable predictions yes. on various risks, various trajectories. Mm -hmm. Who who is likely to be you know, a, a representative in Congress, a senator, a president, what have you, and CEO, on down the line. Now you can you can take a look at people's color and make predictions. When that is broken, when you can no longer make such predictions, I would say it's at that point that um, we've hit the um, racial promised land. I think that's very good. I like that. Thank you for inspiring uh, me and inspiring us, I, I trust. Uh, the heart of my question is, uh, is economics. Uh, because Dr. King uh, in Memphis uh, certainly hit on the central point of, uh, of economics. And I see that as really the promised land. when. Uh, African Americans, for example, represented 58% of the people that served in Vietnam, but yet when they came home, they did not have access to economics. Can you address the importance of the economics in America whereby all Americans have an opportunity to serve, for example, <clears throat> on the Federal Reserve, uh, to actually uh, have representatives on the board to look at opportunities that will bring about uh, equal access to housing and equal access to education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Start. 
Well, I think that you certainly touched on a you know, key difficulty. So, for instance, I mean, as things are now across American life, if you just take a look at indices of well-being, we see a racial hierarchy. And you certainly see it with respect to economic well-being. So, for instance, if you ask the question, if you compare the wealth of black Americans compared to the wealth of, let's say, white Americans, there is, there, the, the disparity the, it is just huge. I didn't say the income. The, there's a big difference in income. But it's the difference in income is nothing compared to the difference in wealth. How that is going to be dealt with, addressed, is a huge question. And frankly, I do not have a good, cogent answer to that. I mean, if you think about all of the things that are arrayed against addressing that problem, and you, I'm in California. Um, affirmative action, which is frankly a very, rather, you know, rather conservative yeah. reform, has, you know, in this state generated a constitutional amendment. Y'all can't have it. Um, Affirmative action, rather conservative reform, has generated all of this reaction. And that's just a rather little thing. Nothing like what you're putting your finger on. And that's going to be a huge thing to overcome. And we need to be spending a lot more attention than we are spending, you know, thinking about how to overcome that. Well, I, I think one way to overcome it would be f for us to, to have a um, political party that demands and insists that every American has the need to work, 99% of us want to work, and we do work, and that the resistance movement that has been raised uh, in the United States from the 60s primarily, I maintain, is a resistance movement that is anti-democratic. So when will the Democratic Party, for an example, again, as in the 70s and the 60s said, we must have work for all people, and when have they said governments must, along with business, work together to have a fully employed society. That as a goal would become one of the ways that we can move back towards progress of ordinary people. Uh, I say the resistance movement to that, the Chamber of Commerce, big business, the Koch brothers, the Tea Party, the Republican Party, but many people in the Democratic Party. Work that we Americans need to have done is not being done. And private business will not do it unless there's a profit for it. So the public sector must take up the cudgels again to make that work happen. The private sector will not build libraries for rural areas or for small communities. That needs to be done by the nation as a whole. And many of the libraries that we do have, many of the sewer lines we have, many of the electrical lines were done by the Roosevelt administration in the 30s and 40s on behalf of the people. Well, there's still work that we the people need to have done. So local, state, and national governments must get off the sticker of trying to pretend that the Koch brothers create jobs. They need to get back to the business of looking at the work that needs doing and then going ahead and doing it and putting the people to work to make it happen. It can be done. Just a little footnote. Yeah. It, it can be done. And, yeah. and, you know, your comment, I think it needs to be underlined that there have been periods not that far in the past yes. where, as an official matter, the fact of the matter is there was a promise of full employment. That's right. 
It's just that we've gotten away from it, yeah. and then people forget. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, 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 this is not a revolutionary thing. The fact of the matter is that Congress at various points over the past you know, 75 years has at various points said full employment. But then it gets forgotten about. And now, of course, I mean, it's not, you know, the idea of guaranteed work. Mm -hmm is not even on the radar screen. That's we need right. to bring it back onto the radar screen. And, and, I think, and I also think that another thing has happened, that when we had strong unions in the manufacturing sectors, the we black people benefited. I saw this where I grew up in Ohio, in that huge area around Massillon, Ohio, north o northern Ohio, uh, western Ohio. Uh, we saw black families who were able to lift themselves up because they got better and better wages and benefits in the factories. And I maintain that one of the reasons big business discovered that they could make an automobile for less in China than in Los Angeles was because black folk were emerging in those unions in ways that they wanted to resist. Now they. I'm making an accusation, uh, Professor Kennedy. The Chamber of Commerce would deny it, but the resourcing out of six million jobs from the United States in the last decade to overseas companies where they say it makes us more competitive has not really benefited the nation at all. On the contrary, it has meant more of the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few people and it has also meant, therefore, the decrease of the American people doing the work that we can do. Do you think, the hold it, do you think that that was, I mean, because the way you put it, they wanted to do it to stick it to black people. Do you think that that was what was going on, or do you think that they simply wanted to enrich themselves, and frankly, they didn't care who they stuck it to? It could be black people, it could be white people. They, and frankly, they were just indifferent. That's a good point. It may be that they wanted to just get the more of the money yeah. themselves. That's clearly what happened. But I think the attacks on things like Social Security uh, is an attack also that is an, a racist attack. Because many, many ordinary people today depend upon Social Security. And the pretend that it's a cause of the deficit is not simply a mythology and a lie but allows the confusion to reign so that the Social Security at this point can't get the support for expansion <laughs> of benefits, for the expansion of the numbers of people who are in part of it, while the attacks continue upon public pension programs, teachers' pensions, and so forth and so on. So I, 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 do, I do accuse them of being also racist. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is um, Jesse Sherrod, and I'm from Mississippi. I actually grew up during the time of the movement, and uh, my father was a civil rights worker and uh, actually integrated a cafe downtown Hollandale when I was in the eighth grade. I grew up picking cotton for two cents a pound, and I had the opportunity of going to Harvard Medical School. I have two questions, though. I actually, I'm very emotional about this. I want to say that I'm honored to be here and to be in front of two of the greatest uh, men that um, participated and contributed to the civil rights movement. And I'm trying to summarize these two questions because I have a lot of questions. But the first one is dealing with how do you level the playing field? I mean, we've been given equal opportunity but we don't have equal resources. Our labor was utilized to build a country. We were given freedom, but no resources. So if you could just comment on that particular question. And then secondly, could you talk a little bit about, we, we kind of uh, romanticize the desegregation thing, and I think it is good. There is some good in all of it, but I think there's also I can see a downside to the desegregation for African Americans. I think we want an equal opportunity, but in the process of desegregation, we lost our village. We lost our home base. 
we, when I grew up, you know, I went to a segregated school in Hollandale, Mississippi, but our teachers were like our parents. My parents were not educated. My mother went to fourth grade. My, my father went to fourth grade. My mother only went to eighth grade. So they couldn't tell me how to fill out an application to go to college. My teachers did it, you see. So can you talk a little bit about what we actually lost? And, and I feel now that in some ways, as African Americans, we're, we're in a worse situation than we were before the desegregation. My nieces and nephews tend to speak worse English. I mean, I talk to them about this. I went to a, an HBCU. I mm -hmm. went to Tugu College, and I was one of the first students from there to go to Harvard Medical School. And after I went, several people came up for 10 years from that college. And I'm glad to have led or blazed the trail. But there are some downsides, I think, and I think we need to discuss that. I'd mm -hmm. like to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Great. OK. Um, I'll go backwards. Let's start with the downside to desegregation, because one does hear that from time to time. People talk about there being a time when the black community seemed to have been, to have had more solidity to it, more of a sense of solidarity. Um, there was a time under segregation, after all, when because of segregation, uh, you know, sort of the, the more affluent black people lived closer to their less affluent, you know, racial kinsmen and kinswomen, because, you know, they could, they, they, they had to. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned um, uh, historically black institutions of higher education. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, there was a time, again, not so long ago, when uh, the Ralph Bunches, and the you know leading the, the the Sterling Browns, where could they teach? Well, you know, uh, white schools or John Hope Franklin. White schools weren't going to hire any John Hope Franklin. He could he could be a great historian all he wanted, and they might say, "Yeah, you're a great historian, but uh, you know we don't want you." And so, where were they all? They were at you know they were Benjamin Quarles. They were at Hampton, and they were at Howard. And, um, and then desegregation comes, and you know, Harvard, and Yale, and Princeton, and the University of Chicago, and all these places take, open the doors, and these people you know, leave. And the institutions that they leave behind are, in a certain way, less well off. They have actually lost some very important human capital. And that, you know, it's happened in a variety of institutional settings. What do I say about that? I say that, you know, progress always has two faces to it. I think, I think that you do have a point. It's, it's, it's never just one thing or another. I would caution you against nostalgia because, you know, we talk about in the, in the old days before the fall of de jure segregation, we think of the solid black community, but you know, the black community in those days, there was a lot of dysfunctionality. There was a lot of black entrepreneurs, for instance, having a captive client base treating their captive client base terribly, because after all, you know, white, they couldn't go to the white people, so you were stuck. That wasn't good. People think about the historically black institutions. Um, I'm writing a book now about this, you know, the, the civil rights era. Some of the authorities in higher, higher education who were the most tyrannical, the most dictatorial, the most repressive, were black college presidents who, in order to hold their jobs, had to repress, or at least thought they had to repress, the black student insurgents. So, 
you know, I, I think, you know, was there loss? Yeah, there probably were some losses. But overall, the fall of Jim Crow segregation was a tremendous step forward. Um, how do we level the playing field? That's a, that's a you know, that's a million dollar question. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, Black people have been pushed down in the United States so far that the idea of, I mean, the Civil Rights Revolution, we were just trying to get, forget about leveling the playing field, we were just trying to get to a playing field. That's right. Yeah, that's true. It was only, frankly, at the end of the eruption of protest between 1950 and 1970. It was only at the end, you know, Martin Luther, you know, where do we go from here? It was only at the end that people started thinking about, well, you know, what about reparations? What about doing something more than merely not trying to put, you know, thank you for not smooshing us down in the dirt, that was an advance. But what about making up for when we've been smooshed down in the dirt for the last century? That only, people only started questioning that at the end of the Civil Rights Revolution, and we're still in that. Well, I think these are very important questions. It's one of the reasons why, in my own judgment, um, black people, black churches, Black organizations ought to be discussing these matters and, talk, and working on them for us to be able to make an adjustment to the times in which we live together and to see the way, way through these issues. We don't have a level playing field. Poor people in this country generally don't have a, and they're more white poor still than black poor or than Hispanic poor. So uh, the, the whole, that whole issue of the level playing field is an important issue, but people ought to be working on it at the local level. Secondly, I'd say we have to remember that it is segregation and racism that cause some of these issues. As an example, school desegregation plans were always the plan, just about every time, they were the plan that the federal, white federal judge uh, agreed to with the white school board. <laughs> the plan of the black social scientists who were so much involved in that Brown decision, <laughs> those plans were almost everywhere rejected. So the desegregation plan in the first place was primarily a white power development and not with the participation even of the lawyers who fought the case. I mean, as an example, in Little Rock, where I visited frequently in 58, and knew all the Little Rock nine people, I still know them, eight of them now. Um, as desegregation came to Little Rock through the federal court, black students in high school volunteered to do the desegregation. Some 85 black students said, we'll go into Central High, one of the finest schools in the country at the time. The school board and the judge chose only nine. 85 black students had parents backing them. They wanted better biology labs. They wanted physics courses. 85 said, we want to do it on their own, sometimes without their parents, other times with their parents. So the plan came out of racism rather than out of <laughs> those folk who had spy who aspired for a new day and for change i think i i just want to press that but i come back to the fact that we need to be talking about these things locally in such a fashion that we can come to a common um, awareness of the issue and a common willingness to see what we can do about it Thank, thank you both so much. I have a question for Reverend Lawson. Um, Reverend Lawson, from your time in India, what did you see or witness 
that impacted you that you still carry with you today? That From your time in India, yes. what, what was something that was very impactful for you that you still continue to carry with you to this day? I saw American military policy and domestic policy in the three years I was in India. Um, and therefore, America calling uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Gandhi, who had um, organized and agitated the Indian people to moving towards democracy and getting out of the British Empire, the first such nation to do that, we try to impose upon them our Cold War. And Nehru said no, that there are other options for the human race. And therefore, one of the keenest political minds of the 20th century, Nehru, we lar largely smothered. And Gandhi, in many ways, who coined the term nonviolence and led his people to independence and self-determination uh, was pretty much covered over in public discourse in this, in this nation in the uh, 40s and 50s. So Western civilization that had a chance for a major contribution from two keen men and scholar and learned men about democracy and about how you change the world and change yourself. Uh, a brown-skinned man who coined the term nonviolence in South Africa. Those, those voices were critically left out of the public conversation in the United States and in the world. Thank you both. Uh, Reverend Lawson, you said something earlier in the evening um, about the civil rights era, and you, you said something to the effect that it still isn't really seen properly, or there's something about the civil rights era that we're, we're still not getting, or the way it's been presented or remembered. Could you talk about that? Well, I think Professor Kennedy has, has, has uh, re related to that in a number of ways, but I would say it this fashion. Even the term civil rights is still seen by too many Americans and too many white Americans as being something connected to black people, not to the country. So there's far too many, far too many white people are unaware that the civil rights revolution, the legal revolution that took place, that cleansed the Constitution in terms of racism and segregated law. But, it, but that legal effort also got the Supreme Court to say that the Constitution applies to everybody. Most people don't know that the Civil Rights Bill of 64, Title VII, wiped away, it, no, I said another one. It made the law that still stands in the United States that you private public sectors are not to discriminate against people because of gender, national origin, creed, or color. That's still the law. No matter that we have a Supreme Court today that doesn't understand it. <laughs> it's still the law. But, but most Americans are unaware that until that time, the private and the public sector had every leverage for discriminating against all kinds of people who were fully qualified to do the work, but couldn't get through the door. Through the door. Uh, I don't even think, I don't even think that white women understand that Title VII gave them an advantage over black people in getting into the university, getting jobs that they couldn't have before because of gender. So that's, that's part of what I mean. We, we do not see the civil rights movement as an extraordinary movement of people in this country that tried to open up the doors of justice and 
equality for all people. Just to, I, I, I think that's a really, and obviously the audience does too, and I think quite correctly, it's a very nice point. Um, many people who, after the 60s, just time after time, when you talk, for instance, with feminist leaders, and they get, they, 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 they're you know, giving an interview, and people ask, well, you know, sort of, when did you find your voice? <laughs> instance after instance after instance, they found their voices in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. They were inspired by the civil rights movement. Um, Harvey Milk, you know, yes. any number of That's people right. who have been the forefront of, you know, of um, gay liberation, civil rights movement. And just more generally, for instance, I mean, I, 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 you know, interested in the First Amendment. People, when they, when they, you know, you have a demonstration. You have a demonstration. I don't care what it is. You just assume that if you want to have a demonstration, you can have a demonstration that the law will protect you. Your assumption is largely right. If you were taking a look, though, well, what are the cases, what are the legal doctrines which enable you to, with confidence, say, I want to have a demonstration on Saturday. Here's what I want. And the government, I want you to accommodate that. If you take a look at, you know, what allows for that, you know what you see? You see cases like Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham. Now, you knew Reverend Shuttlesworth. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You see Good cases friend. like, in, in, you know, it's the civil rights cases. Everybody in here, or many, any American, can belong to a, um, uh, uh, an, an organization. You belong to an organization, and you assume that your membership in the organization is confidential. You assume that the government cannot publicize your membership in the organization. You're largely correct. You're largely correct. There's such a thing as organizational privacy. Where did that come from? That came from cases like NAACP versus Alabama. Mm -hmm. If you take a look, we, the mm -hmm. um, newspapers day in and day out have the freedom to uh, make comments and report on public figures without fear of being put out of business by people suing them for libel. Mm. Where does that come from? New York Times versus Sullivan. Yep. Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> over and over and over again. Yeah. The Civil Rights Revolution, it, it, clearly it helped out black people in many ways, but it was much more important than that. It's, it ramified, it has many more consequences. Just it, the point. It opened up the meaning of freedom for the Very whole much. society. Very much. In so. a massive fashion yeah. that goes unrecognized. Yeah. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you very much. It's a real honor to uh, listen to you. I'm also an Ohioan from Canton, Ohio. Eight miles. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, um, I've, I've had this uh, conversation with Professor Kennedy, so I'm going to direct the question to you. Um, and it, it builds off of some comments that you made earlier about the current state or the lack of a current state of activism within the African American community. Um, and I wanted to um, uh, get your sense of how we've come to a point where if blackness is part of the public debate, um, it's now gendered exclusively as male um, to the effect that even some of the ways that we celebrate the civil rights history is now exclusively framed as male. So I just got an email from the Congressional Black Caucus. On Thursday, they're gonna have um, some kind of, of panel. Um, it's looking at um, Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and the frame is educational success for black men and boys in a post-Brown versus Board of Education era. 
Now, it goes on to say everything you said about we have high levels of segregation, um, incredible mm. uh, 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 achievement gaps, um, educators and leaders have to come together to figure out how to close these gaps. But the hook is that the panel will highlight research that, have helped, that has helped African-American male students in school. Now, from my own reading of history, there have always been, you know, some differences. Uh, I think you mentioned that your your mom went to school a few years longer than your father. Um, African American men have um, been more likely to be lynched than than black women. Um, uh, slavery had differences, but I don't think that we ended. We came together to end slavery because it was hard just on the men. I don't think that we fought against segregation because it was hard on the men. I don't think we fought for voting rights because it was hard on the men. But now if you look at the dominant way that we tend to talk about racial justice inside of our community, it's almost exclusive, exclusively about men. So the president's my brother's keeper, all about men, as though girls are doing swimmingly well, and they're not. If you look at economics, black women still make less than black men, but you wouldn't know it, for, yeah, but you wouldn't know it from the way that people talk about it. They still have less wealth. Black women have $100, you know, median net wealth. Mm, yeah. So I'm really concerned about what's happened to the idea of shared fate. You know, I don't think Fannie Lou Hamer was mm. going to the Democratic Convention just to complain about black men being the, not denied the right to vote. I think we thought that it was a community problem and the community should stand together. I'm, my sense is that we've lost that sense. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, I agree with what you've said <laughs> and the question you pose. I, um, I think that that America is increasingly, in the last 30 years, fragmented, and the divide and rule is in place. And I think we in the black community must, I think, resist um, these kinds of divisions. I'm quite lukewarm about this kind of process that's going on that you've described. Um, intellectually, emotionally, and otherwise, I know that racism and sexism and violence and plantation capitalism are intricately linked to one another. We cannot remove this oppression either from the angle of sexism or racism without the other. Racism is not going to be removed in this country if we cannot remove sexism. And it does have to begin in the black community. And violence is not going to be removed if we do not remove, at the same time, racism. Because racism is a major part of the spiritual poison that undergirds the violence in the United States today and the mythology of violence. The economic questions is deeply, profoundly connected. So my own thesis is that we need to look in terms of st inclusive strategies that allow the black community to be united across the board in the campaign to rid ourselves of this 21st century version of slavery and racism. Let me jump in for just yeah. two points. One, I can't really see that well because of the lights, mm -hmm. but I know the voice. Yeah. And the person who just asked the question is um, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw of the UCLA Law School. Um, she, um, she's an activist and an intellectual and a very distinguished law professor. And there was one sentence that you spoke of in particular that I'm sure warmed her heart because she's thought of as sort of the, sort of the, the master of um, intersectionality, the idea of, you, that's right, you can't deal with racial oppression without at the same time dealing with gender oppression. So you've, you've certainly warmed, I know, one person's heart <laughs> very much um, this evening. I, I, wanna, I wanna, though, go back to a point that was in her question that's an that's a issue. 
because she did, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very practical issue. The President of the United States, a few months ago, hmm. set forth an initiative, the My Brother's Keeper Initiative. Now, you might recall that when President Obama was, was candidate Obama, he gave a speech late in the campaign in Philadelphia in which he was seeking to explain his relationship with Reverend Jeremiah Wright. And in, the, in, and in this speech, at he ended the speech by saying that we need to be, he talked about, he used the phrase, my brother's keeper. But then he said, my brother's keeper, and then he also added something. He said, and my sister's keeper. Now, a couple of months ago, he, had this, he unveiled this initiative, my brother's keeper initiative, and there are some people who are quite critical of that because, in their view, it's all too partial. I mean, what do you mean, my brother's keeper? What, what about black women and black girls? Now, this raises a very practical question, it seems to me. What, first of all, you know, so is that, did he do, what do we think about the My Brother's Keeper initiative? I mean, there's some people who would support the president and say, well, it is the case that in a bunch of different ways, black men and black boys are being peculiarly, particularly disadvantaged in American life. And this is an initiative aimed at trying to do something about it. We can't deal with all things at the same time. It's just various reasons he chose this one first. And so some people would say, you know, support this if you want to do something else later or the next day. Do it, but don't criticize this. There's some people, however, who say we should criticize this because this has an element of sexism built in at the very, the very same time that, you know, he purports to be doing something progressive. How do you see it? How should we, at this moment, deal with this My Brother's Keeper initiative? Well, uh, <clears throat> if you wanted to stop the assault on the black male, you could go after zero tolerance disciplinary patterns across the nation. Because it is the black male in the school systems who gets suspended the most and kicked out of school, expelled the most. So it seems to me there are other initiatives that could be perhaps even more effective. One of them would be redeeming the public school system. 300,000 teachers have been terminated across the country. We need them in the system. So one possibility, both economically and otherwise, might be to put those people back to work and then to double the numbers of teachers we need in public schools to do smaller class sizes, to do more work concretely in the way in which the black school principal in Memphis and Nashville did uh, in, at Melrose and Pearl High, in both of those cities, in, in Melrose and Pearl High. The, the school system then was something of a social science as well as educational system, where teachers and principal sought to get every student to recognize they had infinite worth and that they had infinite possibilities and that their part role in the school was to tap that and find out what it was so they could go, go onward in their own lives. So maybe, maybe that's the place. I don't know. Okay. One more question. And then our last spiels, and then reception. Two questions. We'll have another one back here. Hello. Thank you so much for your time. I just wanted to know, given the Supreme Court's recent decision to uphold the ban on affirmative action, what hope do you see it having for other states? And if so, in what ways can it be addressed, given the large misconceptions behind affirmative action? And my name is Danae Joseph. I'm a second year at UCLA. Okay. 
you know, I mean, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think there should have been any surprise around what the Supreme Court was going to do with respect to the last affirmative action case. I mean, remember, I mean, the, the, it wasn't about affirmative action per se. It was about the circumstances under which a jurisdiction could get rid of affirmative action if it so chose. So I don't, I don't, I don't think, frankly, it, it changed a whole lot in my view. I, I assumed that the Supreme Court was going to do what it wanted to do. I'm against the way the Supreme Court deals with affirmative action. I think that, you know, if you take a look at affirmative action, even when the Supreme Court is, you know, doing, is, is, is coming down a, quote, good way, in my view, it's still laughable. So when the, the Supreme Court says, oh, a public university can have affirmative action for the purposes of diversity. Now, if a, if a public university says, you know, we want to have affirmative action in order to do something about righting the wrongs of centuries of oppression, oh, no, you can't do that. That's out. We, in fact, that, that's just, that's out. That is not a justification, a sufficient justification for affirmative action. The only justification the Supreme Court will recognize is, well, we want to have you know, a certain number of minority kids in, just like we want to have some you know, rural kids in, just like we want to have some oboe players in, so that the university will have a nice you know, diversity of voices and perspectives. That is more pressing than trying to do something about centuries of oppression. What sense is that? It makes no sense to me. But that's what we've got. Now, here's where I think, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't have very high regard, frankly, for our Supreme Court, at least in the racial area. In fact, I mean, I wish the Supreme Court would just go on a recess. <laughs> no, go on vacation for years. <laughs> And I think it's a, it's a real problem. I mean, take a look at this, this case. This case of a year ago, the Supreme Court's case in Holder versus Shelby County, that is no laughing matter. I mean, the Supreme Court really took a big chunk, took a big bite out of one of the key acts of the Second Reconstruction, the Voting Rights Act. I mean, it didn't, you know, it didn't, destroy the Voting Rights Act altogether, but it took a big hunk out of it. That should give us a lot of, a lot of pause. But last thing, I don't mean to filibuster. The Supreme Court's a very important thing. The law is a very important thing. But here I want to get back to something that Reverend Lawson said early on. Now, the law is important, but more important than the formal law is public opinion. You know, so frankly, the Supreme Court, fortunately, fortunately, through a lot of struggle, a lot of collective struggle on various fronts, and there are lots of fronts, Professor Crenshaw engages in struggle not, you know, so much. She, you know, she, she gets on picket lines some of the time. But her main front of struggle is, you know, Writing law review articles. That's a line of struggle and a very important one. Through struggles in a lot of different domains, roots have been put down. And one very important root that's been put down in American life is the idea that important institutions in American life are viewed as really illegitimate if they are monoracial. If they're racially homogeneous, people start getting nervous. And that's true even amongst people who say they're against affirmative action. The best sign that affirmative action has really sunk roots is to take a look at the actions of people who say they're against affirmative action. So you have a president who says, oh, I'm totally against affirmative action. I'm totally against taking race into account in decision making and allocating of various things. And then Thurgood Marshall retires from the Supreme Court 
and this President of the United States chooses, of all people, Clarence Thomas. <laughs> oh, but by the way, race had nothing to do with it. Every four years when the Republican Party, which by the way, is you know part of the Republican Party platform, it's against affirmative action. You know, we shouldn't take race into account, handle everybody, you know, as individuals. We we are race blindness folks here. Take a look at the convention. Every black person who is a Republican <laughs> is front and center. You would think this is the party of diversity for that week. <laughs> What's my point? My point is that even people who say they're against affirmative action know that the, that the country has evolved in such a way. People get nervous when you have an institution. There are no people of color there. There are no women there. So even people who, frankly, are reactionaries try to get some diversity because the idea of the idea of diversity the idea that you got to have different people in major institutions of american life that idea as attenuated as it is as attacked as it has been has sunk roots now you know we need to build upon that expand that but it has sunk roots, and I think it will continue, frankly, regardless of what the Supreme Court of the United States says. Thank you both very much. A couple points I wish you would relate to. First of all, when you're speaking of civil rights, I don't hear a lot of things about class. We're talking about sexism, but I don't hear that, and I think that's a component. Second thing with regard to schools, I'm a teacher, it's close to me, is the from school to prison pipeline. That's a, certainly a very important thing. The desire to privatize education, that certainly impacts. And we have a de facto segregation in school now more than it was before. Yep. Even before they supposedly in, desegregated. In Los Angeles, it. sunny California. It's true. I don't know. <laughs> what was your, <laughs> what, what's your question? I mean, I think, I think that, you know, here we do have a little, the fact of the matter is we live in a society where that's scarred, that's defaced, deformed by all sorts of injustices. And I think it is important to keep in mind the array of injustices, whether it be, I mean, you know, we still live in a you know, sexism, very powerful, very influential. Mm. Racism, very powerful, very influential. Class is very important. I mean, the, the, the you know, um, class stratification, of course, does occupy a somewhat different status than these other classifications because, of course, class stratification in the United States is the American way. <laughs> that is not viewed as a bad thing, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, if you were to go on an airplane and, you know, no, you can't sit here because of your race, oh, that's a bad thing, and no, you can't sit here because of your gender, that's a bad thing. But the idea of, you know, first class, <laughs> that's perfectly fine and dandy. And, you know, I mean, we live, I mean, seriously. So, you know, you say that we didn't talk about class, and I think that you're right. And I think that we are going to have to learn, I think for myself, I'm going to have to you know, really work on being more attentive to illegitimate class stratification. And one reason why I'm going to have to work, and I think many of us are going to have to work on that, is because the powers that be have done such a good job of naturalizing it and making it seem that, you know, that's okay. Uh, well, I, um, I, think, I think that people of goodwill in the United States, people who say that they're committed to um, this 
experiment in self-government, which is the first largest such experience that ever took place in the 18th century. But I think people who are so concerned and committed, I want to see the dismantling of every vestige of racism and of sexism and the economic and social political violence of racism and sexism. I think that we can better handle the class issue <laughs> if, we if we dismantle entirely racism. So we we'll know better how to handle the class scene if we can get out from underneath the racism, the sexism, the violence. Uh, in, in the church, I've resisted an interpretation of Jesus and interpretations of the scriptures coming primarily from the German theologians. That has been a major movement in the 20th century of theology, in my century, in the Bible. Because my contention is that I better understand Jesus from my own American experience and from the racism and the prejudice and the bigotry over the century, over the years, decades, than from a class structure or from a, ge a German theological perspective. So I, I think that the American scene can be better understood from the point of view of its sexism and racism and the, that form of violence. I mean, after all, uh, you know, after all, part of the organization of our country was the burning of the witches, <laughs> the hanging of women. The first victim of religious bigotry in the United States was Mary Dyer, hung in Massachusetts for being a Quaker and not a Puritan. In, I think, 1659, her, her statue was on, in the Boston Common still. I think that history and the history of women in slavery and the history of the conquest of the Indian and the women there, I think all of that history and the consequences of that history need to be dismantled before we're going to better, we're going to understand the issue of class. <clears throat> we, um, we've really been um, honored, again, by uh, your presence, Reverend Lawson, and I really do thank you for sharing your, your, your memories with us, and thank you for sharing your reflections with us. And Reverend Lawson will be available for a bit more discussion. There's a, there's a reception. And, uh, and Professor Kennedy also. Well, yes. I'll, I'll be there too. Yes, but, yeah. but no, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, I mean, listen. Um, you know, let's give, let's, 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 let's give praise where praise is, is most due. I was, I was, I was um, you know along with other people in here, I have been the direct, not the indirect, I have been the direct beneficiary of what you and your comrades did in the second Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And we should be grateful for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>